Um, all right, so hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Keith, a third year PhD student at Newcastle University. I'm part of the One Planet Doctoral Training Partnership, which involves Newcastle and Northumbria universities. And I'm lucky to have brilliant supervisors from both, uh, Liz Lewis and David Pritchard from Newcastle and Nick Rutter from Northumbria. A huge thank you goes to them for helping me get this far with the project. And also thanks to NARC for funding my research. So who am I and what am I doing here? Well, after my civil engineering degree at Newcastle, I worked as a consultant in Leeds before deciding to become a teacher, doing my teacher training at Southampton University. After a few years, I moved back to the Northeast, working in schools in Northumberland. And for a while, I had wanted to get back into the world of water, being motivated by climate change impacts on flooding in particular. So in 2019 to 20, I did the hydrology and water MS, uh, what, sorry, hydrology and water management MSc at Newcastle and was lucky enough to get funding to do this PhD starting in 2020. My research is all about precipitation in mountains, but why do we need to be bothered about that? Well, firstly, around 22% of the world's population, a fairly big chunk, depends on runoff from mountain regions for their water supply. Now, as the climate warms, patterns of precipitation are changing, which impacts on the timing and the volume of water from mountains, affecting available water resources with increased risk of drought and especially flooding. Many mountain catchments across the world are snow dominated. In other words, flow in rivers is determined for much of the year, not by rainfall, but by snow. In the coldest winter months, there might be prolonged periods with little or no rainfall, but very high snowfall, which accumulates on the ground. During these times, river flows decrease and sometimes to zero. Then when the snow begins to melt in spring, flows increase rapidly, which of course can cause downstream flooding. When rain falls on top of snowpack in late winter and early spring, we see some of the most rapid runoff events, causing flash floods with potentially severe impacts for communities and wildlife habitats. So the images on this uh, slide show examples of flooding in mountain rivers. So firstly, we see the Rocky Mountain Ski Resort of Canmore in Canada, which is inundated by flooding on Cougar Creek, caused by heavy summer rainfall in June 2013. The second image is of the River Feshi in Scotland, with flood water resulting from a combination of heavy rainfall and snow melt in December 2018. And both of these areas have significance for this project, as you'll see in a bit. Okay, so we've established some of the issues connected to mountain rivers, but why am I so interested in precipitation? We can just get that by interpolating from gauge measurements, can't we? Well, no, it's not that simple. Working out the how much, where and when of mountain precipitation is a tricky business, as it varies so much across space and time. Now, having a better understanding of precipitation patterns is so important for things like water resource planning and future flood forecasting, we need the best possible data as inputs for modeling studies. So this is a story about the challenge of representing spatial precipitation patterns in mountains over time. Now, as we know, our best way of measuring precipitation is to use gauges at point locations on the ground. The data we get from these isn't perfect. Our measurements can be affected by where the gauges are positioned. For example, are they near any obstructions? And in mountains, gauge undercatch is a real problem, causing us to underestimate precipitation when the percentage of rain and snow that gets caught by gauges is reduced in windy conditions. We can also experience the opposite problem of overcatch. And this occurs on dry days when snow blown from the ground lands in gauges, making it look like there was snowfall on those days. Now, quality control procedures are used to reduce, but not completely remove gauge data uncertainty. Despite the issues surrounding their use, we most often use these observations as truth. They're our gold standard, if you like. However, at difficult to access higher elevations, there are fewer gauges, so we have less data to work with. And even when gauges work well, they only tell us about specific locations. What about all that empty space in between? Well, we need a method of interpolation to infer precipitation amounts in between gauge locations. There are several existing techniques to choose from. Some work better than others, but they have some flaws. These traditional methods can be very useful for some applications, for example, nearest neighbor Thiessen polygon type approaches, especially where topography is relatively smooth and the catchment in question is fairly well gauged. 
However, existing techniques give us inadequate precipitation fields for ungaged and poorly gauged catchments, which is the case in mountains. They underestimate precipitation amounts and they tend to smooth out variations in space. This happens when methods don't take account of spatial relationships between gauge sites. Weather conditions at one gauge location are not completely independent of conditions at a gauge, say, a few kilometres away. So rainfall at gauge one on our slide here will have a degree of influence on whether or not it's raining at gauges two and three and so on. Likewise, dry conditions at gauge four will influence the likelihood of it being dry at gauge five. And all of this is a function of distance between the gauges. The closer they are, the higher the correlation between them. At greater distances, the spatial correlation is likely to be lower. We need to account for this in mountains where we have sharp changes in elevation that affect precipitation patterns and amounts. Also, this smoothing effect really doesn't help us when it comes to extremes of rainfall and snowfall, which we need to capture effectively to help us predict future flows and potential flood and drought events. Other techniques such as using radar data and satellite images are useful for telling us about spatial patterns but they're less accurate than gauges when it comes to giving us actual precipitation values. And in mountainous terrain, radar signals get blocked and often report less than 50% of observed precipitation. So in the mountains, we need better ways of estimating rainfall and snowfall. In this project, we're building on a cutting edge method for generating spatial fields called random mixing. Unlike standard interpolation methods, which give us just one version of a spatial field. Random mixing is used to generate lots and lots of spatial fields with different precipitation amounts being assigned to each grid cell across a model domain. This gives us an ensemble or a range of possible estimates. And from this ensemble, we can optimize to select the most realistic fields to use as inputs for modeling. Having lots of random fields is all well and good, but they're not all going to be realistic because they're random, right? So next we control or condition them using real world observations. So we make sure that the precipitation amounts in the spatial fields that we create match the gauge observations at those locations. A little bit like using anchors to fix things in place. The image on the slide represents an example of one field from an ensemble for one very wet day, the 20th of June, 2013. And these white crosses and initials show the gauge locations. In previous studies using the random mixing method, it has been tested on relatively large catchments of several hundred square kilometers or more with dense gauge networks, something that we definitely don't have in mountainous areas. So the research gap this study aims to fill is in three main parts. To adapt the method for high elevations, snowfall as well as rainfall, and a sparsely gauged smaller catchment, which for the time being, the one that's, uh, that I've been looking at so far in the study is the 9.1 kilometer squared Marmot Creek Research Basin in the Canadian Rockies. It's about 90 kilometers upstream of Calgary and very close to Canmore, where we saw an image of flooding on an earlier slide. For such a high elevation catchment, it is relatively well gauged with three weather stations in the area. And they each have a Geonor weighing bucket gauge that measures total precipitation by mass. Now we have complete time series precipitation data for 2005 to 2016 and stream flow data for 2005 to 2012. The highest of the stations, this one at Fizera Ridge, has mean annual precipitation of 1,072 millimetres and 70% of that is snowfall. In contrast, the lowest station, Hay Meadow over here, has mean annual precipitation of just 544 millimetres and only 37% of that is snowfall. Mean annual air temperatures vary between minus 0 0.4 Celsius uh, at Fizera Ridge and a nice balmy 3.1 Celsius at Hay Meadow. And the photos at the bottom of this slide show the three stations. So the one on the left here is up on the high ridge. The middle one is in a, a clearing a bit lower down. And this is the lowest station um, down on the meadow heading towards the plains. So to hydrological modeling, all models are simplified versions of reality. And if we think of a model as involving inputs over here on the left, internal processes and outputs, well, we already know what our inputs are here, data for precipitation, air temperature, and other meteorological variables. 
The outputs for the model are things like stream flow and soil moisture. And in cold regions, we're also interested in outputs like snow covered area or snow water equivalent, which are ways of estimating how much snow is on the ground. And when choosing a model, do we want simple ways of representing physical processes by using sort of single parameter values, say for canopy interception? Or do we want to mimic reality more precisely by solving complex equations that represent these processes? If we go for a more complex model, we can probably represent the system better, but we make it harder to obtain a solution. Conversely, a simpler model structure will uh, arrive at a solution more quickly and saving us computing time, but it may model the system less well. So we decided at an early stage in this project that working with a fairly simple hydrological model to begin with would enable most of the focus to go on developing the model for generating the spatial fields, which is the main purpose of the study. Now we chose to go for a version of the much used HBV model, first developed in Sweden around 1970. There are lots of versions around, and we went, one, uh, went with one, uh, which is the Delta Res W flow version, uh, which uh, thankfully is coded in Python, which is the only language that I have any familiarity with. It's uh, spatially distributed, meaning that the catchment is based on a model grid. And as we're working with a small catchment, we've used a small grid cell size of 50 meters squared. Also, it's a conceptual model, meaning that it uses fairly, uh, a fairly simple approach to modeling physical processes. Now, HPV was enhanced for this project with functions to represent snow processes, such as accumulation, uh, melt and refreezing, and also avalanching. So we calibrated the catchment model, optimizing parameter values to minimize the difference between observed and simulated stream flow. To evaluate model performance, we use metrics to compare those two things, those two flows. And here we used Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, or NSE, a measure of how well the flows match, especially at higher flows. An NSE value of one indicates a perfect model fit. It wouldn't mean that the model is perfect, just that it fits perfectly for the flow data that we've used. Our calibration run gave an NSE of 0.76, which is pretty good. We also used a bias metric to tell us about water balance in the catchment system. A perfect model would give a bias of zero. And we ended up here with a bias of minus 21, telling us that we have a negative water balance. This suggests that the simple spatial precipitation inputs that we used for calibration are underestimates. And hey, that's not a surprise given what I've been talking about so far. The hydrograph on this slide shows observed flow in green and simulated flow in orange. Now you can see that event timings are well matched by the model, uh, but that much of the time flows are underestimated. In other words, the orange line is mostly below the green line. In contrast, though, here on the 25th of May 2008, the model peak flow is double the observed amount. I think this is due to a unique combination of events here. Following an eight day dry spell with warm temperatures of up to 15 degrees Celsius, causing lots of snow melt, there were then four days of heavy precipitation. And this was accompanied by temperatures dropping to around freezing. So it's likely that the relatively simple HBV model setup resulted in higher runoff here than in reality, at least partly due to the way that snow melt is modeled. So the first key aspect of the random mixing method is accurately representing our observed precipitation data. Dry days and wet days are considered separately in the model. And to do this, we chose a dry day threshold of 0.1 millimeters. In other words, less than 0.1 is a dry day, greater than or equal to 0.1, is a wet day. Firstly, we calculate the dry day probability, P0, which as the table on the slide shows, is higher at lower elevations. And this is what we would expect, fewer dry days higher up and more dry days lower down. Wet days are represented by a best fit probability distribution as shown on the graph. Now you can see distribution curves plotted for our three stations, although the green and orange lines for upper clearing and hay meadow mostly overlap. The key feature here is this scale value on the right hand side, which, as you can see on the graph, decreases with falling elevation, representing the fact that we get less precipitation at lower altitudes. So that was the first key thing about our precipitation. Now, as discussed earlier, spatial dependence is highly important for producing realistic spatial fields that can capture variability and extremes. And so this is the second key feature of our model. 
Our initial three stations over here are very close together. So to enhance our representation of spatial relationships, data from two additional gauges within a 20 kilometer radius of Marmot Creek was obtained. These are to the north and the east at Kananaskis and at Bow Valley. These locations are on the very edge of the mountains heading east towards the plains. So we correlated daily precipitation for each pair of gauges and plotted them against separation distance between each pair. And these are the points in black that you can see on the graph. For our model, we need to fit uh, to, we need a best fit curve to represent this spatial relationship. And initially fitting this, getting it right, was a tricky time consuming process. And as you can see, the curve in blue that we ended up with uh, isn't a perfect fit to those points. But as mentioned earlier, models are always approximations of reality. Now, in a densely gauged catchment, not like this one, there would be enough gauges to sample from to give us a robust distribution to generate each day's spatial field. For example, in a study by Grundman et al. in 2019, 71 gauges gave 71 data points for each day, giving a nice curve. However, we don't have enough gauges for this to work well. The first fields that we generated were really low quality, like the one here on the slide. The plot has a stippled appearance, and much of what's generated is statistical noise rather than plausible precipitation values, which here are much too low. So how can we overcome the problems presented by having so few gauges? Well, we do have lots of observed values from our long 11 year time series. So let's try to make the most of that. An example of an improved quality field is shown on this slide. Now the range of values is more representative of reality and the spatial pattern is more realistic. To optimize the most plausible or the best fields, we run lots of HPV simulations using a different set of random fields for each one. In addition to observed and calibrated flows, the hydrograph on this slide uh, shows outputs from 200 ensemble HPV runs in light blue. Now, the best performing of these fields gives us an NSE of 0.67 and a bias of minus 32.6, which is definitely not an improvement on the calibrated model, which you can see uh, there in the yellow line. However, at this initial stage, we were taking the simplest approach of using mean values for the dry day and the wet day uh, parameters across the whole catchment. And we weren't specifically accounting for changes in elevation. So let's move on to those now. Here, we're applying the different dry day P0 and wet day scale values separately for each station instead of the mean of the three. We've also introduced elevation gradients into the model. This means that the model is now applying for each 50, for each separate 50 meter squared grid cell, the dry day and wet day values according to their elevation for each day. And this is the most important modification to the process so far. And it's had a promising impact on the fields generated as a result. This slide shows hydrographs for the period between April and September 2011. The top plot is with no elevation dependence in the model and the bottom plot with elevation dependence shows improvements made by accounting for it in our spatial fields. Clearly, there's an improved NSE of 0.82, which is good, and a smaller negative bias of minus 19.2 is also a step in the right direction. You can see by comparing the hydrographs that the ensemble flows, the ones in light blue, are largely unchanged on the rising uh, limb between May and late June. So here on the top plot and also on the second uh, lower plot, they're very, very similar. However, that's at a time when flow is mostly driven by snow melt. On the recession limb, however, over here on the right-hand side of the main peak, between July and September, stream flow is driven by rainfall. And now the lower plot shows higher ensemble flows, which is encouraging. So we've, we've improved now on the baseline calibrated model. So we're largely above the yellow line here but um, they're still less than the observed flow shown in the dark blue line. So we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. The next refinement to be made to the model, which is underway now, is to separate our precipitation values into three intensity bands, low, moderate, and high. The idea is to generate new spatial relationships for each of those bands. Now we're most interested in the highest values because we're more concerned for now, at least with flooding. If, as expected, the spatial relationship is different for each band, then we might see further improvements in our spatial fields. And if this is the case, it should further increase the volume of water in the system, 
getting the bias closer to zero and then I see closer to one. We'll soon see. Having done lots of work on improving the random mixing method, the next step will be to represent Marmot Creek using the Cold Regions Hydrological Model, or CRHM, which is a more complex physically based model. The idea will be to see if we can better represent the catchment response, do we get better model outputs? Using the simple HBV setup has been helpful in getting us to this point, but it will be interesting to evaluate whether it limits our ability to demonstrate the improved performance from using our random spatial fields. Depending on time, it would be good to test out the new method in a high elevation catchment in another part of the world too. Now, thanks to Andrew Black at Dundee University, we have precipitation data for Feshi in the Scottish Cairngorms, so hopefully that may also form part of the study. To quickly recap then, this project is all about improving estimation of spatial precipitation patterns in mountains. And we're using a random mixing method to generate ensemble spatial fields, which we optimize to find the best ones. The key, improve the key improvement made so far has been including uh, elevation dependence in the way that the fields are generated. And the next steps, uh, well, firstly, to split the precipitation data into intensity bands to see if that gives us further improvements. And after that, the plan is to test the technique using a physically based model and hopefully to apply the method in another catchment, this time in Scotland. So thank you so much for sticking with me through this presentation. I hope you found some of it interesting and I look forward to taking some of your questions. Thank you and Merry Christmas. <laughs>